and welcome to Thrift Shop Biography. This is the one about Matthew Perry. Thank you for listening. Hello. Hi. So this week I've had another new book which I've been really pleased about. I think it's the area I live in. Everybody's posh. Yeah, that's and so they right. buy the books when they come out. So I got a nice hardback copy of the autobiography of Matthew Perry, better known as... What? Oh, oh Chandler. <laughs> Chandler from the hit sitcom Friends. Yes. Did you like Friends? Were you a Friends fan? Yes. You can't not watch At Friends. At the time. Well, you could. Some people don't like it. At the time, and I watched. I had a big party to watch the last episode. Did you really? Fancy dress. So Friends was massive, obviously, at the time, but it's continued to be massive, hasn't it? If you turn on your TV at any time during the day, a channel will be still showing Friends, like 25 years later. Yeah, and people wear Friends t-shirts. Kids wear Friends t-shirts. So there were people who weren't even born when it came out Mm. that are huge Friends fans now. Yeah. I never watched it at the time. Did you not? No, but I catch it now. I think it's really good. (laughs) It is really good, right? I remember actually being in a dressing room in the theatre or whatever, the green room, and some actors were all coming and going, and Friends was on, and I was just hanging out, and an actor came in and said, these people are so good. Mm. Their comic timing is absolutely amazing. And that's the first time I actually clocked that it was more than just a funny comedy, that, Mm -hmm. that these people were really good, and I started watching it and thinking about that Mm -hmm. and it's true and now I watch I always watch it thinking about that because it's live and it's they're brilliant Mm -hmm. it's theatre it's like Mm -hmm. theatre I think as well when I didn't watch it I thought oh god it's just six generic American adults Mm -hmm. in jeans Mm -hmm. and Mm t-shirts they just don't seem that defined but now I watch it it's just like oh that characterization they're all actually quite different yeah they are see i was living with cool people at the time in a shared house way cooler than me and they all hated it it made me question what i was watching in a negative way at the time until the actors said they were brilliant comics and then i felt allowed to um Hmm. enjoy it so friends obviously is a big part of matthew perry's life but it's not all of it what do you know about him aside from friends have you ever watched anything else he's done no, I don't think I've ever watched a single film he's made going through the list. And I knew he was had a difficulty with drink and drugs. Yeah. And I assumed that came because of Friends. <laughs> because I imagined he got really famous and then that had driven him to drink and drugs. Yeah. No idea. It's weird because, like I say, I was never really into Friends. But as I read this book and I'm reading everything else he's been and I've not seen any of that either. You haven't. Really. I'm very aware of who he is. Yeah. And I'm very aware that he's very good at being Chandler. Mm. So, shall we start? Shall we? So, Matthew Perry yeah. was born in 1969. Yeah. To gorgeous parents, right? Yes. Very good looking. So good looking. So why isn't he that good looking then? Yeah, I know. I did go back and look at him and try to work out if he's good looking. I think he probably is. Oh, no, he he is right. It's just that I never considered him good looking. But actually, when you look, especially when he was younger. Yeah. I think he's just quite nondescript good looking. So he doesn't stand out in a crowd. But actually, everything's in the right place. Yeah, I guess he was standing next to... Joey Tribbiani. Yeah, who is good looking. <laughs> He's really classically yeah. good looking. And also maybe the character of Chandler isn't that sexy. So you don't yeah, really, maybe. he doesn't come across as... But then I started watching him in all these other little TV snippets when he was younger. Mm-hmm. He's not standout. Yeah. With heartthrob. It's interesting, the photo on the cover of this book, I actually thought, oh, he's really good looking. Did you? And I'd never noticed that before. Now anyway, this is all very shallow. <laughs> but it's all because he goes on about how attractive his parents are. Yeah, which I guess is a really hard thing to live up to. Yeah. Especially when your dad is the old Spice Man. OK, yes. Yeah, so his dad is an actor and a musician and a singer. They're Canadian. And his mum, Susan Langford, Suzanne Langford, was Miss Canadian Snow Queen. So oh, wow. she was that gorgeous. Yeah. So your mum is Miss Canadian Snow Queen and your dad is the old Spice Man. I mean, that's a yeah. lot to live up to, isn't it? Yeah. He's an actor, a singer. Everybody loves him. And he gets this advert. And I'd watch some of them, did you? The old Spice adverts. Oh, no. He's like coming out of the sea, looking amazing. He's, he's the 
picture of the perfect man and the perfect dad. He's got a fake family in oh, these adverts. Oh, I know. He yeah. writes about that in the book about saying how his dad to him wasn't the perfect dad, but then he'd have to watch the adverts on TV and his dad was being a yeah. perfect dad. To him. Well, the sad part is they split up before he was one. Yeah. And his dad moved to LA to carry on his career. But his dad was always on telly as this family man with kids and stuff, but he wasn't there in his home. That it's must... like, that's my dad. Yeah, that's quite that's surreal harsh. in a way. And yeah. it must really, it must be upsetting. It's quite a weird scenario, really, for it, you not to yeah. have a great relationship with your dad. But here he is on TV playing the perfect dad. Yeah, he's only coming into your lounge through your TV set. With strangers for children that he clearly really cares about. (laughs) Which he later actually had a new wife and kids. But, yeah. So he's brought up by his mum. And I never knew this. His mum was quite legendary in her own right. She was the press aide for Pierre Trudeau. Yeah. Who was the Prime Minister of Canada. Canada. And she was so glamorous and beautiful that she kind of got quite famous in her own right. She was on the news a lot and everyone... Yeah. She really got noticed. Mm -hmm. And if she walked in the room... Everyone was looking at her. And Pierre Trudeau was a good-looking man as well yeah. and had dated Barbara Streisand and Kim Cattrall. Yeah. So they're quite... Do you know who his wife is? Pierre Trudeau's, Pierre Trudeau's wife. The woman no. he married who is now the mother of, what's his name? Justin, Justin Trudeau, yeah. the current Prime Minister well, of Canada. I... His mum, i.e. Pierre Trudeau's actual wife, is the woman in, you know, the safety dance by Men Without Hats? No. I remember okay. Men Without Hats, Yeah. A big 80s yeah. fun tune. Yeah. She's a woman dancing in the video. What? <laughs> so he went from Barbara Streisand <laughs> and Kim Cattrall to the woman dancing in the Men Without Hats video. All right, that's still cool <laughs> in my books. <laughs> okay, so we're not just being shallow. They're a really good-looking bunch yeah. and successful. Yeah, he becomes a latchkey kid, he says, because his mum's out all the time and his dad's in LA. And he gets angry and at some point beats up Justin Trudeau uh, at school. Yes. They're at school together, yeah. which means he went to a nice school. But no, I think an important thing before all this is that he says that he was born crying. No one could work out why. And he was just horribly crying, which would have probably driven his parents apart. Because that can drive people insane. And he's their firstborn, right? So they have no experience of having a baby. And And if your baby doesn't stop crying, it's probably really frightening. Yeah, yeah. And they really were young. They met when they were like 19 or something. And after months of this crying, the doctors drugged him. And they gave him addictive barbiturate, which is uh, phenobarbital, which he had a lot of problems with later. He says that as soon as they drugged him, obviously, he fell asleep straight away. And how his dad used to think it was funny. Yeah. That must have been such a relief, though. I know it's not. Oh, yeah, no, sound I can great, imagine. Yeah. But if your baby cries constantly, yeah. the fact that you can drug them so you can get a good night's sleep is good. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he doesn't outright say it, but his addiction to drugs probably started when he was Formed. born. By the way, he says that he doesn't blame his parents for this no, whatsoever. No, it's not their fault. That's yeah. the doctors. Yeah, they went to two doctors and they both... It's a, so it's kind of like, you know, and of course we're talking 50 years ago yeah, now. Yeah, it's one of those, it was the different times, blah, yeah. blah, blah. But it's interesting to think that his addiction could have been formed at the age of three months when the doctor prescribed it. It actually is. Because when you think about that first period of growth as a baby, it's so rapid, actually, and things are being formed. Children, actually, who were born to mothers who drank and did drugs in pregnancy, that does stay with them. It is interesting that his addiction, which basically has ruined his life, may have started right there at the age of three months. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mind you, his dad kind of did have a drink problem. Did you get that? Well, his dad is a functioning alcoholic, which, as we've discussed a lot... So is the whole world, yeah. pretty much. It's just our society. People come home and have a drink. And there's a difference between drinking and being an addict. And he mentions this quite a lot because he hangs out with people who love a drink, but he can't stop. Yeah. And they are hidden in society. Mm-hmm. The difference is completely hidden because everybody's having a laugh and getting drunk and nobody can spot that amongst them is somebody who 
can't stop. I'm new to learning this, honestly. Oh, do you know what? Because I gave up drinking, I don't know, 10 years ago. It's really obvious to me now through social media, the amount of people on Facebook and Instagram who almost every single picture they put on there, they've got a drink in their hand or there's a bottle of wine on the table and you just think, now I don't do it anymore. It's normal to them, but it's actually quite obvious if you don't do it yourself, just how much these people drink. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's anything that takes you out of being completely sober. Yeah. It's taking you away from thinking and dealing with everything head on. Anyway, this man has a massive problem. And he says that he is trying to combat all the negative thoughts in his head, which tell him, this whole book starts with him saying, my voices in my head say, I'm not enough, I am worthless. I shouldn't be loved. I'm not worthy. You know, all that. Why do you think he tells himself that from a young age? Yeah, it is odd. He cites having a total breakdown on an aeroplane when he's five. This is, I think this is the moment. The turning point, a catalyst. Yeah, where his parents divorced, his dad moved to LA to make it as an actor. Yeah. But his mum and him stay in Montreal. So he is then put on a plane to go and visit his dad by himself yeah. when he's five years old. Yeah. It doesn't say how often he did this, but I'm guessing it's more than once. He's uh, absolutely terrified. He's never been on a plane before and he's on his own at five. Lots of worse things happen to people, but this just happens to be the thing that completely flipped his mind. I think, yeah. it, I think it actually traumatised him. Some people are more sensitive than others as well. This traumatised him. You know, you're termed an unaccompanied minor when that happens, and he refers to himself as an unaccompanied minor at various times throughout this book. It's a Mm. real life-defining moment Mm. that comes very young. And do you know what was interesting is how he doesn't blame his parents for the barbiturates he was given at three months old. Mm. And he doesn't explicitly blame his parents about being an unaccompanied five-year-old. But I just sense there was a real kind of bitterness still about it. But he actually goes, why couldn't you fly over and hold my hand? Yeah, Yeah, he does kind of. Yeah, They should have done that. Yeah, they should have done that. But, you know, if his mum is working for the prime minister... Yeah, that means she's got enough money to pay for a flight, for an extra flight. She might not have time. She might not, but she could have paid for the dad's flight to come and get him. Oh, okay. You know, it's not like they were broke. They weren't broke. I wonder if there was something about the pair of them bickering, saying, I'm not coming, I'm not bringing him, you're not bringing him. So they said they just... Or they thought it was all right because the flight attendants look after you, you know, and they did. When we were little kids on the flight, they were so nice to us and gave us lollipops and we got to go in the cockpit and look at the... Do you know what? It sounds fun being an unaccompanied minor on a plane, but I bet the reality of being... Five years old yeah. and then leaving your mum and suddenly going yeah. with strangers and getting on a plane. And when there's turbulence plane. and you think you're going to yeah. die and all that stuff. Anyway, that's literally... He's, he says he's probably spent over $7 million on therapy. I tell you what, the therapy and rehabs are shit. Uh, this is something I yeah, kept thinking Yeah, he's been robbed. This, yeah. He's been actually robbed, especially the rehabs. Absolute bollocks. Honestly. This book throws up bigger questions about rehab and addiction and how it's dealt with. Because if somebody who literally has more money than anyone can't solve their addictions, then who can? They're almost like stupid cults, aren't they, that are just taking your money. Somebody who has more money than anybody else in the world, you probably think when you're clean... And then you think, oh, maybe I'll just have another little bit. It won't matter. You probably think, well, I can afford to go to rehab again. Yeah, actually, I almost think he's addicted to rehab. Damn it. But there's loads of them that that are absolutely rubbish. But also, he's such a strong addict that they can't help him. Oh, my God. It's almost hopeless, isn't Mm. it? I think AA almost sounds like the best one because of the way it operates with sharing stories and having sponsors. The actual human sponsor that you can't let down that will phone you and talk you through anything and that you can do for someone else. It's like he says, eventually, the reason he has to live is because he can help someone else stop drinking. And that's given him the most reason to live that he's ever had, that he can help someone else. Do you know what? A lot of this book, I felt, was just stuff that had been programmed into it for years of therapy and stuff. And I was thinking, really? Do you really feel that's the best thing? (laughs) I agree. (laughs) He's really good at tennis. 
Yes, he's really good at tennis. Yeah. I think that'll be one of those things where the addictive personality yeah. is you have to put all your energy into something. And he was practising eight to ten hours a day as a, an outlet, really. By 14, he had a national rank in tennis in Canada. Yeah, so he's good. He's really, really yeah. good. And it, during this time, his mum remarried to a bloke who worked in TV, he got a new sister, but that's when he started acting up probably felt himself being pushed out. He also said that his mum dated a lot of men and every single one, he latched onto them like a father figure because he wanted a dad and absolutely loved them. It's the opposite of some people who rebel and push them yeah. out. He wanted a father figure mm. and so every time she broke up with someone, he lost another dad. Oh, sad, isn't it? Yeah. And then finally she remarries, has a kid and then he started acting up. But he says at school, he learned to make people laugh and it became like a drug to him. When he got laughter, he thrived on that. Mm -hmm. And he was in a school play, got a lot of laughs, and it was like drugs. You know that he talks about the sense of abandonment. Actually thinking about his mum having lots of boyfriends and becoming yeah. attached to them for them to leave. I mean, he's constantly being abandoned, actually, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, I guess he? so, yeah. He does say, in like the first page of this book, he says something like he has a chronic fear of loneliness mm. to the point that when he's in rehab, he has this personal assistant who is in the room with him, sleeping in the room yeah. with him. He just doesn't want to be on his own. And I bet that is from being five years old and just being dumped at an airport to get on a plane by yourself. Yeah. And yet, when he isn't alone or he's got a relationship or something, he pushes them away yeah. to preempt them yeah. leaving him. Because yeah. he can't deal with them leaving him, so he pushes them away first. Oh, it's classic, that yeah. is. Poor boy. I know. But anyway, then he, he started acting up at school. His grades were sliding and he started smoking and he was doing pranks all the time. Yeah. Whilst being amazing at tennis. Yeah. <laughs> is that right, Mishmo? But he's also drinking from the age of 14. And drinking. So, again, like we find that a lot of these people in these books, they just function at a high level of yeah. energy, don't they? Yeah. And he had these two mates who were brothers, and yeah. the three of them once decided to get drunk. So they got absolutely hammered. The two brothers were puking up everywhere, and he was lying on the floor. Instead of puking, he was going, oh, my God, this is amazing. <laughs> I've found peace Something clicked and he went, yes, all my voices, my negativity have gone away. And that was the beginning of that. So he's living with his mum and her new partner and his sisters, mm. um, who he loves now, by the way, his grown up sisters. But at the time, he, you know, he's a teenager and he's at that age, he's 15. He wants to go out into the world and do his own thing. And he's had a bit of experience of acting and making people laugh. And his dad's a jobbing actor in L.A. Yeah. So naturally... He wants to go and, he's and be with his dad. True, he's arguing all the time with his mum as well. Yeah, but the thing is then when he makes a decision to go and live with his dad, everyone, his mum loses a plot and she's so upset. So he stays downstairs like packing his bags and he said one by one, every member of the family comes down to the basement to tell him what an arsehole he is and look what you're doing to your mum. We can't believe you're doing this. You're breaking the family up. I mean, that's pretty awful, actually, that he had to then put up with all of that yeah. negative emotion from that lot. Yeah. But he yes, goes. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't blame him in a way, because I think when you're 15, you kind of need to go and find yourself. But he had the opportunity to do it because his dad was in L.A. Yeah, but he actually also thought that he was going to be a tennis star. And that's the, a really better place to train in tennis. Mm -hmm. And then when he got there, he went to the tennis club and realised <laughs> it was average. Because in Canada, you can only play a certain amount of months a year because the rest <laughs> of the time it's snowing. <laughs> See, he should have done ice hockey, really. He would have been an ice hockey star, yeah. but no, he picked tennis. He goes to LA where the sun shines all day, every day, all year round, and those people can practice all year yeah. round, and he was just average. Yeah. And he realised that straight away. Mm -hmm. So he thought, oh, well, I might try acting then because my dad does it and I probably would like it. His acting career got going quite quickly really after did. arriving in LA. Yeah, because he was 15 when he moved, and I think he was 15 when he started getting yeah. roles on TV. yeah. It, was, it just seemed it? to happen that quickly. Yeah, yeah. I, I bet his dad had a, a few connections yeah, or an agent sure. or something because yeah. he never trained. Yeah, so he's on TV in a couple of like one episodes of established shows, and then he um quite soon gets a recurring role in a sitcom called Second Chance, mm -hmm. and it goes for a second. I think he, the second season kind of becomes a spin-off about his character. 
right? Whereas the first yeah. season is about the family, but then it evolves into... So his character must have been a hit yeah. for the second season to kind of focus on him. Yeah. Yeah, so he's kind of getting lots of TV work. So he gets his part in a film with River Phoenix called A Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon. Yeah. And he's playing his best mate. I mean, he had such a great time on that film and he became mates with River Phoenix. So, he's yeah, he's just having a... And at the age of 18. 18, he's, he's gone to Chicago to film it and they get on like a house on fire, of yeah. course, because they're sort of bad boys at that point. <laughs> they're drinking, drugs, all that stuff. Yeah. And yeah, sadly, River Phoenix... Oh, just a few years later, yeah. yeah I mean, that that, that is that. one of the tragedies of the life of an addict, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody can be an addict for 50 years or somebody can die when they're yeah, 21. Yeah, that's right. Or was whatever. he 21? I don't I know. He was really young. He was really young. And what's shocking is he says that he... He could hear the screams outside the Viper Lounge when River Phoenix died because he was living a couple of doors up and he didn't know what it was and just went to sleep. And that was his really good mate. Yeah. Dying is awful. Can I just say as a side note, did you get that he was digging at Keanu Reeves a couple of times in this book? I was saying that why does he live Yeah, and other good actors don't? Yeah, he kind of says... It's not fair that River Phoenix died whilst Keanu Reeves is still walking around on this plan. You can think, well, yeah. that's a bit. Yeah, it's really harsh. And then later, he's in another film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's in another film with Chris Farley, who dies young. Yeah. And he says it again. Yeah. He says, it's not fair that these amazing talents die while Keanu Reeves is still walking around on the planet. Yeah. It's kind of like, what did Keanu Reeves ever do to you? Yeah. It's weird. He has a real bone to pick with Keanu Reeves. Twice in this book, he says Keanu Reeves should be dead, basically. Yeah, he does. I guess these people were really charismatic, real characters. Whereas compared to Keanu Reeves, it is kind of the dull one. Do you think? Oh, I Isn't think... he seen as that, though? No. Is, isn't I... he the benchmark of a dull actor who just no, made good? No, no. I'm now a massive John Wicks fan, right? Yeah. So I love him now. I've never loved him more than since the John Wicks film. He's amazing. But he's really kind of made a thing out of being dull. Like, it's almost like he's in a trance. But I don't get that. I don't think Matthew Perry would be saying that if he just thought he was a crap actor. I think there's personal do stuff you? going down. Beef. Yeah, I do. I found it weird that he... I found it rude that he would say it once. But when he said it the second time, I was a bit yeah. like... What? Really? It's a really harsh thing to say. Yeah. In fact, it's an unnecessary thing to say. It's bad enough that River Phoenix died. We all get that. It's bad enough that Chris Farley died. We get how tragic it is. You don't have to drive that home by saying it should have been Keanu Reeves. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) Anyway. No, yes, he gets Beverly Hills 90210. Yes. Playing tennis. Yes. He does three (laughs) episodes. Which is, it's the hottest show on TV. Yeah, and do that, you remember it? I watched that, it was great. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. No shame. <laughs> but he was quite heavily featured in three episodes, so that was good for him. I watched a clip of it. Yeah, so did I. Yeah. YouTube's great. Yeah, it is, Everything's it? on there. I know. Yeah. Oh, he auditions with his dad for a father and son role. Oh, yeah, it's harsh. And yeah, Matthew Perry gets it, but his dad doesn't. No, he does say his dad struggles a little bit with how successful he... He got more successful than his dad at the time he was 16, 17. But, you know, that's life. Yeah, and also his dad abandoned him and became a dad on TV. Yeah. And that little boy had to see that. So in yeah. a way, I don't care that yeah, he... Yeah, touche. Yeah. <laughs> tough, isn't it? Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> but then he gets a part on a sitcom called Sydney with an actress called Valerie Bertinelli. He's married to Eddie Van yeah, Halen. Yeah, I had to look her up, actually. She was quite a babe. Yeah, for sure. She was a bit older than him because he was 19 at the time. Mm-hmm. He fell in love. Yeah. He kept it quiet. He couldn't say, but he's fully, full on, properly in love yeah. with her. And I think he thought when you have that massive crush at that age on an older person, you think everything they say to you, even every single time they look at you, you think, oh, my God, they really like me. That's because of the, your brain just rearranges stuff. They yeah. can say something quite innocent. And then your brain that's in love with that person can skew it and think, oh, my God, she really likes me. I got there was a bit of that. Yes, going I on. think she was flirting, though, knowingly, because... There's a story in here that he goes to her house and he's hanging out with Eddie Van Halen, who is a legend. And Eddie passes out and they have a snog. Oh, yeah. They actually have a proper good snog. 
And he says something like, I've really been thinking about this for a long time. And she said, so have I. Well, that's probably because she's just sexual and she's flirting. So she probably was flirting. That's my clue. Right, OK. But to his brain, yeah. oh, my God, she's in love with me too because she's been thinking about it too. No, she's just been thinking about it because it's yeah, fun. Yeah, so he thinks she's going to leave Eddie yeah. Van Halen. She actually going to map out his whole future with the love of his life oh. the next day at work. Like nothing, because it's just a funny, fun flirt with a young teenage man. Oh, I mean, that will break you as a 19 year old. You'd be gutted. Yeah, but it's also a bit of a rite of passage. Yeah, it is. Coming of age experience. Yeah. At least it was with a totally hot babe wife of <laughs> Eddie Van Halen. By the way, we should also, when we're talking about this sitcom Sydney, we should also say that he's in it. There's another actor in it called Craig Bierko. I never know how to pronounce his name. Yes. There's another actor in it called Craig Bierko who they both had roles in the sitcom and they become very, very good friends. Yeah. Now, I mention him because he's about to come up again in a minute. They're but, um, really similar. They probably get... Well, they are going up for the same roles a lot. And yeah. he says this man is hilarious. He says oh, yeah, he's he funnier than me. Right. Yeah. I unwittingly saw Craig Bierko on other things, not knowing who he was or where oh. he fit into. And I liked, I liked him. He's very charismatic. Right. He's a good actor, and he is very funny. Ah, yeah. yeah. So when he's doing Sydney, he's with Craig Bierko, and he's around nineteen. And then they go for lots of auditions and stuff, right? Yeah. And there's a five years passes between Sydney and the next thing he talks about. He's suddenly twenty four. Right. So they've been obviously auditioning and doing this and that. But he says that drinking is ruining auditions for him because he looks a mess. Right. He looks and sounds a mess. He's probably slurring. He's mm -hmm. just being a drunk. He's successful enough that he's probably partying a lot. Well, they're young actors in yeah. Hollywood, aren't yeah. they? But it's not helping him getting jobs. Of course, yeah. So he's 24 and he gets this pilot for this show called LAX 2194. Yeah. Oh my God, it just sounds so terrible. terrible. But he's about to run out of money and he suddenly gets paid 22 grand. So he's really happy about the money, but it's set in the future, 2194, in an airport, what's it called? LAX, oh, baggage handlers. Baggage handlers. Yeah. <laughs> what? I watched a clip of that on YouTube. I did too. <laughs> With Ryan Styles. It's fantastic. And, yeah, it just looks so crap. Terrible. I kind of thought maybe... Do you remember Red Dwarf? Yes. I kind of thought, I wonder if this is kind of like an American version of Red Dwarf without yeah. it being a remake. I wondered if it was just that kind of... It reminded me of it slightly, although... <laughs> Futuristic baggage handlers. Oh, my God. It's, it's such a terrible concept. <laughs> but Matthew Perry's committed to it, right? Yeah. Well, he's as in contractually yeah yeah not mentally yeah no of course yeah <laughs> so he's committed to that and craig bierko is also doing very well and he actually secures parts on two sitcoms from the pilot season yeah. one i can't remember but the other one is called friends like us yeah and he says this script was going around the circuit for this new sitcom and it was the funniest and best script he'd read in years yeah. everyone knew this was gold because it was such a good script. That's interesting. That Again, it's kind of like saying, do you know with these other books we've read, like with Mel C knowing as soon as she saw the advert of the Spice Girls, she yeah. knew that was it. And, been, and it does sound like when Matthew Perry read the script to Friends, he was like, oh my God, this is it. Well, he knew he was Chandler. Yes, that's it. He yeah. read that part and just thought, well, this is me. That's Why? me, yeah. But also it goes to show how good the writing was mm -hmm. and always was in Friends. The same people that did... Well, anyway, the director, Jimmy Burrows, was the same bloke who did Taxi and Cheers and Frasier. Well, so it's just, you. it's yeah. in that ilk. There must be a load of shit scripts knocking around when you suddenly... Oh, yeah. Well, really... there's one about baggage handlers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so he's committed to that and then he's reading this friend yeah. script thinking, oh my God, this part yeah. is me. The casting director is aware of him because I think they cast him as something a couple of years ago, but he's already contracted to LAX... 2194 and it clashes with friends so he's yeah. not up for consideration no because they all know he's contracted elsewhere yeah whereas craig bierko is offered the part of chandler yeah and this other thing and another yeah. show and so he comes to see matt perry and says which show shall i take and he's like oh what a nightmare because i don't want him to get chandler because that's my job mm -hmm. but i can't have it and i've got to be honest to my friends and he tells him, you should take Chandler. 
that's really good friendship and yeah. honesty because otherwise it might have come back to bite him on the ass as well and it, it doesn't he's guilt free because his friend goes off and takes the other part the other and doesn't job. listen to his friend's advice. Yeah. So that part is then suddenly, even though the whole thing's been cast, last minute it's suddenly available again. This TV executive's wife, who was lying in bed one night, said, hang on a minute, is that LAX pilot going anywhere? And her TV executive husband or whatever went, no, it's going nowhere, that's done. Right, well, Matt Perry's available then. So they got him in. They got him to in. Read for the role of Chandler. Boom. And the rest is history. Yeah, because he said he got laughs where they didn't even realise there were laughs. Boom. Is that a Chandler line? No, it's just a phrase oh, in okay. real life. <laughs> <laughs> so it fit. He fit the role and he yeah. made it. He just took it to another level to the point where the cast and directors and the producers are just like, oh, yeah, hi. Yeah, it, yeah. This, is, this is it. Side note of interest to me is that Lisa Kudrow was cast as Roz in Frasier, but she got fired by Jimmy Burroughs, the director of Friends, in the pilot. So obviously not because she was bad, but because she just wasn't right for Roz. I can't imagine her being Roz. Roz is Roz. And then she got Friends and she's right for that. Perfect for Phoebe. That's amazing. Imagine how Lisa Kudrow must have felt after being sacked yeah. from the pilot of Frasier. Yeah, you've got so then, close to an amazing yeah. job and fame and money and everything. And then little do you know that just a year, yeah. two years later, all of a sudden you're the biggest thing on the biggest... Yeah. Which is why sometimes actors shouldn't take it personally because they're just not right. Doesn't mean they're not good. Yeah. But he says all six of them were so on it. Every single one of those people knew they'd struck gold and it was the best job in the entire universe. I think Jennifer Anderson was also contracted to another show, wasn't she? And they had to kind of get her out of something, I think. She was. No, I know this now. She had already started filming a sitcom about three women and it was halfway through filming the season and friends really wanted her, which is amazing for a kind of semi-unknown actress on a for a big hit show to really want someone. They got her out of her contract. So a lot of thought and consideration went into the chemistry and the dynamic of those six people, actually. It's all in the casting, isn't it? Matt Perry is the youngest. He's 24 what surprised me is that Courtney Cox is 30 and Lisa Kudrow is 32 at the beginning of Friends. Yeah, that's amazing. They yeah. don't look it. No. And it does explain why they've had a bit of surgery now. <laughs> because they're older than they should be. Yeah. So <laughs> and yeah, I love that they all turned up knowing how precious this job was. All of them were on top of the lines. And he said there's almost no bloopers from Friends because that's how on it they were. Mm-hmm. And he said, what a rich environment it was. Everybody was brilliant. Directors, everybody. They took each one out to dinner separately to get to know them so they could incorporate some of their characters or their ideas into the characters. It's really cool how much input they all had, actually. And you can see how it would have made it work because they had to keep going for how many seasons? Ten, Ten? I think, yeah. like 250 episodes. Yeah, it's I think. amazing. They really were consistent partly because of the input they all had. And at some point, not that far in, David Schwimmer was sort of the star, which I didn't know. He'd done more outside of it and was more of the star of it. I had no idea about that. And he came into a start of a new season and said, I think we should all be totally equal and ask for the same money. And Matthew Perry says that was amazing at that point because he could have easily commanded more money than anyone else. But it was genius because making them all really strong as a team made them have more power. Yeah. And then they commanded a million dollars each in episode. I was shocked at this. I never knew that. I did. It was news. Really? Yeah, it was news at the time because no, no one had got paid that sort of money. For, That's madness. I mean, I guess it's the biggest TV show in the world at that point. Yeah. And they renegotiate for a million dollars each an episode. Per and what, they're episode. making like 20 odd episodes a season. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, but it's right. I remember at the time when it was out thinking, that's right, because DVDs, box sets, merchandise, it was huge. And actually, they were making that money. Those people, they were the band. They were the Spice Girls. And so they should be making that. And also with fame, humongous fame comes, you can't just get on the bus. You can't just go to the hairdressers. So you have to pay a famous person's hairdressers, you yeah. have to pay for a driver. You know, your expenses go massively up when you're famous. <laughs> yeah. I've thought this through for years, actually. 
It costs a lot of money to be famous. Yeah. So it becomes the biggest TV show in the world. And they become very famous very quickly. Mm. And Craig Bierko doesn't speak to Matthew Perry for two years. Yeah. He kind of almost... Well, he does. He blames him that that he didn't take that job, even though Matthew Perry said to him, Yeah, you can't take that him. role. But he's just a bit bitter, I think. Yeah. He doesn't want it in his face. The network hedged a lot of bets on friends and yeah. boy it paid off yeah it really did i mean to the point where it's on tv every day now 25 years later yeah it's amazing because it's on tv because he says if you watch friends you'll see that when i'm really really skinny it's because i'm on drugs pills when i'm really fatter he fluctuates between 128 and 225 pounds during the season of friends it comes and goes if you see he's put on weight it's because he's drinking skinny drugs and if you see he's got a goatee i'm on a lot of pills <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so i started having a little look to see i was like, oh god it's it's weird to know that he's either off his head on he says i never take pills or drink at work but I'm, honestly it's rattling around his system the whole time oh yeah i think when you're an addict like that to his extent you're kind of just high all the time yeah and this is interesting to me so we know now yeah that he's a full-blown addict before he gets Yes, friends. yes, absolutely yeah. full-blown. But you watch Friends knowing this, you can't tell. It does, I can't see in his performance. I can see visually yeah. the difference in his body and his face, but I can't tell in his performance. He's a high-functioning addict, which it actually really makes is. you a really bad one because yeah. you can... You can get away with it for yeah. so much longer before people notice. Although, behind the scenes, people were noticing. Yeah, he talks about Jennifer Aniston coming to his dressing room at the beginning of a new season and saying, we know you've got a drinking problem, we can smell it. He said it was the we that really oh, shocked yeah, him because no, he realised they were yeah. all talking about him. Because, of course, at that point, he's thinking, oh, nobody knows, yeah. you know, and he's probably drinking vodka. Well, he was drinking vodka. And then when she takes him to one side and said, we can smell it on your breath, it's just like, oh, fuck, rumbled. Yeah. But it was yeah. probably way more obvious than he thought it was. Yeah, maybe. And then, oh, my God, out of the blue, well, a year after Friends starts, 1995, he's 25 years old, they want Julia Roberts to be in an episode. Oh, yeah. Julia Roberts said she'll do it as long as she can be in the storyline with Chandler, because that's her favourite. So they said, look, she likes you, so will you try and persuade her to be in it? So he starts corresponding with her, by fact, being all charming and hilarious. She starts corresponding back. Three months, they're writing back and forth, and then they're phoning, and then they're just getting on like a house on fire. So it's a lovely three-month build-up. And then she comes around to his house for the first time and he opens the door and goes, oh, that Julia Roberts. So they have a laugh. He's bloody funny. Yeah, yeah. And they start a relationship, which is actually really nice. Yeah, he's got the sexiest, most famous actress wow. girlfriend in the world. What does he do? Dumps her oh before she'll dump him because why is Julia Roberts going out with me? I think it was a while they were going out. He says, I never forget the look of confusion on her face. Yeah, I bet. Who dumps Julia Roberts? And they're getting on so well. That's the thing. So he's preempting it because he says, if they get to see the real me, and this is a recurring thing, if I let them in properly and they see the real me and then they reject me, I couldn't handle it. And so I can't let it get to that. I kind of get it in a way. You would just, any man on the planet yeah. would never think themselves worthy of Julia Roberts. I do Roberts. with Julia Roberts, but that's the same scenario for every single woman he ever goes out with. Yeah. Do you think he's the only person in the world who ever dumped Julia no, Roberts? No, I think that's probably a common problem if yeah. you're Julia Roberts. I've seen, what's that film, Notting Hill. I imagine it's exactly like that. Oh, that's the premise <laughs> of that film, right? Yeah. That you go out with Julia Roberts. And you Roberts. can't handle it. It's really hard to calm down and... Go out with Julia Go Roberts. Go out with Julia Roberts, yeah. yeah. And she's just a girl. <laughs> Standing in front of a... No, that's man. the other film, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> that's the that's for weddings. Oh, I've not watched any of them. But it's both you, Grant. That's why I've not watched but any I of them. But I think <laughs> that Not A Girl is really heartwarming because it, even though it's romanticised, it's probably an essence of truth in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. <laughs> the thing that really surprised me is how he talks about the cast of Friends. When Chandler and Monica get married, mm. Friends has Ooh. never been bigger, right? I think it's Ever. season seven, yeah. season eight. It's... And that whole season is focused on Chandler and Monica's story. And this is where he's seriously out of control. Yeah, he's actually right. in rehab. 
Right, he's when they're in filming rehab. that, yeah. they let him out on day release. Wow! To film those scenes, and he's back in rehab. He's a total mess. Gosh, it's incredible! Like the biggest scenes from the biggest show on earth, yep. you would never know. No, you that really he was wouldn't. A hopeless addict. I have to say, I saw that episode in the last two weeks. Not a clue. Do you know what? I thought about it a lot since reading this book because he talks so highly of those five other actors in Friends. Yeah. And he just talks about the care they showed him, the consideration, yeah. and he likened it to the penguins. Apparently, when a penguin gets ill or falls over, the other penguins circle around it mm. and until it's all right again and yeah. will help it up. And he said that's what the cast of Friends were like. And when he speaks about them, like Jennifer Aniston coming in, saying to him, hey, buddy, we can smell vodka on your breath. I kind of thought this is Matthew Perry's perspective of it all. And then I kind of thought, just thinking about the others, they were also on the biggest show yeah. on earth with similar pressures and stuff. I bet it was a blast. I bet they had the best time. I bet it was fucking pain in the ass having to put up with a full-blown addict. I bet it caused them so much stress. But but then he says he was absolutely on it and there's no bloopers because they all... If people are going into his dressing room and saying to him, do you know what, you're drinking too much, who knows how much he was slurring in line readings and rehearsals turning up late you know he's a full-blown mm -hmm. addict he's difficult and yeah. that didn't come across in this book because he loves them so much because they were so kind yeah. to him and I kind of thought I bet it was really really difficult for them actually yeah. and I bet at times it put a real downer being in Friends I think we're gonna have to read all the other Friends <laughs> yeah but I don't cast. think they'd say it I don't think Maybe. they'd say Matthew Perry was a massive pain in the ass no not a pain in the ass but we might get another angle on it addiction is an illness mm. right it just is and you can't blame somebody you can't compare it to cancer but let's say for example somebody had really bad cancer yeah. on something like Friends you do everything you could to accommodate yeah. them and I think they're doing the same thing with him, with his yeah. addiction. It's a serious illness. It doesn't mean it's not really hard for those That's other really people. That's really true. And as soon as they have a break, of course, he's either doing another film or he's in rehab. It's, it's not like that would have gone unnoticed. It was reported yeah. a lot. Or he gets out of rehab and drives a car into someone's house. Oh, my God. You know, know you can't know. not know that he was in a lot of trouble. Yeah. And also, you have to think as well, if somebody did have a serious illness like cancer and they were in Friends. Because at this moment, Friends is this unstoppable juggernaut. It's a bigger show on TV. Yeah. It's making everybody a lot of money. I think networks probably <laughs> are even existing on the advertising revenue they get from Friends kind of yeah. thing. Thousands of people rely on that show for their livelihood to support their families, right? So they have to oh, keep yeah. it going. But also at the same time, you think if somebody was seriously ill with cancer... Would they make them turn up every day and film that show? Or would there be some kind of public announcement saying, do you know what, really sad to say, but this person's really ill, so we're just going to let them have this season off to get better? He wouldn't have got better, though. It yeah, no, I, yeah, but he isn't getting better no. with his addiction. No. It's just interesting how people treat addiction. Yeah. It's like they still force them to keep going under that pressure. But you know, I think he'd have done it anyway because he says the only thing that kept me going was friends. The only yeah. type focus. I don't think it's his decision. I think Do people not, around right. you, like yeah. with Amy Winehouse, like with anyone, I think yeah. you have to say to people, hey, you're going off the rails. Go away for a year, get yourself clean. Because yeah. like you say, he's in rehab and filming Friends at the same time. That's yeah. madness. And he took a lot of the films he did. In fact, he said he kind of used films as running away. Yeah. Oh, get, yeah. get me a film quick so I don't, the focus busy, isn't yeah. on me. And, but he did say that driving to Friends was the time when he knew he needed to be alive and he had something to live for. It was always Friends. It was his 100% focus, the thing he did well. And I think as well, like you say, those other people are his friends. I know the show yeah, is called Friends. Yeah. And he does have abandonment issues and stuff. Well, actually, these five other people yeah. and the extended team Family. of friends, they're there and they're not going anywhere. No. So I think that maybe the whole friend thing and the fact they were together for 10 years is what somebody who has a fear of abandonment is what they yeah, need. Yeah. It's true because they ate together. They hung out in each mm -hmm. other's dressing rooms. They didn't get too big for their boots and go their own separate ways. They always were together and looked after each other. Yeah. It does, yeah, it sounds very supportive. Can my cynical brain come into play a minute? Yeah. I think when you're on a massive show called Friends and you all have to be friends, I think there's something in the contract that says you're not allowed to slag each other off outside of Friends because none of them ever, ever have. Yeah, but I think they absolutely love each other. I've watched Why? things like the reunion. I just think they really bonded. Right, partly I think... <laughs> 
you're doing this live though it's not like a film you're turning up once a week in front of a live studio audience i think this is key because it's like theater right you really have to support each other you know it's really disparate in film people are turning up for a scene they film their thing it cuts yeah. they have to do it over and over there they are walking on stage in front of an audience and they absolutely are relying on each other they're bouncing off each other you know that really brings people together it's theater versus film mm-hmm. that friends is theater live studio audience it's amazing that they achieve that you can watch them listening for the laughs to finish you can actually watch them not speaking listening for the laugh and then carrying on if you're thinking about it and analyzing it when you watch it it's amazing it's live theater that bonds people it really mm-hmm. does and they get breaks not like the Spice Girls or any band that is worked to death. They get breaks. They do a season and then have their own life. Yeah. So it keeps them sane and it keeps the band together. And also they're not with each other every day during the week because yeah. they film on a Friday night. Yes. So they would have the script and yeah. then probably learn it, then come together for rehearsals yeah. and stuff. Yeah, they're not together every single yeah. day. Yeah, and they've all got the freedom to do other things outside. So yeah. it's not like a band where they all go mad. I genuinely think they love each other. I watched Everything Friends. I watched The Reunion... When they first finished and they were all interviewed, all of them were crying. And he mentions this, except Chandler, Matt Perry. He's the only one who wasn't crying, but he says he thinks now, looking back, it was probably the drugs because he was just disconnecting from right. it. Yeah. The drugs he uses to disconnect from his emotions. Mm-hmm. Because when they did the next reunion, however many years later, he was the one crying the most because oh. he realised what he had and what yeah. he'd lost. Yeah. Well, they were all bawling. They bloody love each other. And he had a massive crush on Jennifer Aniston yes. for the first, what, two seasons? I mean, who wouldn't? He knew her before. He'd asked her out before Friends when they were just hobnobbing around the LA scene. She'd said, no, but can we be friends? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's OK. He got Julia Roberts. Yeah, yeah. He'd have just dumped Jennifer Aniston yeah. anyway. Oh, yeah, he would have, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, right? I've got to say, there's a film he did in the mid-90s that he doesn't name where he fell head over heels in love with an actress. And this time, for the first time in his entire life, he's let her see the real him. He says, I'm going to go for this. This is absolute real, true love. This is the real me. This is the whole me. And she rejects him. Yeah. And he says that he really couldn't get over that. And he doesn't mention her. It's got to be Neve Camp. You're right. I did, I did my I did, research. I did, and I, I did it. But, yeah, and I... <laughs> Uh, I did research too and I came back but it's Neve Campbell. It's Neve Campbell. It has to be. I googled her. She's Canadian as well. I bet that really I bet he's like, "Oh, it's Canadian my homeland. This is the one. This is the mother of my kids." Let's say with all certainty then if we both come We're up with that name Detective independently. Yeah. It was Neve Campbell. Has to be. That's the one that got away. That's Damn a it. bitter pill for him to swallow and he swallowed a no. lot of pills. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? That really broke him. He talks about it a lot. Yeah. Because it's the one time he showed himself that's his biggest fear. Oh, there's a lot of this book where he's saying, I'm 52, because he switches back and forth, doesn't he? To now, to then, to now, to then. And he's like, I'm 52, I'm writing this book, I've got this amazing house, I've got this view of the ocean, and I'm single, and I've got no one. I've got doctors, I've got drug dealers Oh my sometimes. God, it's so tragic. I want to be married, I want kids, I don't want to die. You know, oh God. Do you know what? It's, it's so sad. It feeds into that whole abandonment thing again. Mm. It's like he had that from such a young age. And then, like you said, he starts making people laugh. And then he's an actor and he's becoming this other personality and people really like it. And then the first time he shows a woman he genuinely likes his real self, she rejects him. I understand how that would send somebody into yeah rehab. Which he already was in and out of anyway. <laughs> I feel this book is actually more about his addiction and rehab than it is about his it, acting career. It is, really. Do you know what? I hate to say it. I'm surprised he's still alive. I am, yeah. What I find sad, really, the saddest of all almost, is that all your rock and roll books where they're doing tons of drugs, there's a lot of fun because the whole band are doing drugs. He's alone getting high he, on drugs. It's not fun. He said that when he was young... Michael J. Fox was the biggest thing and Michael J. Fox had the number one film at the box office which was Back to the Future and the number one TV show which was Family Ties and he said wow that's something to aspire to do and then 10 years later Matthew Perry 
is in Friends, and then he does a film with Bruce Willis, the whole nine, yeah, the yards, whole nine yards, which is a box office hit. And he's the first actor since Michael J. Fox to be in the number one TV show and the number one film. And he said, whilst all that was going on, when he was the biggest singer on the planet, he was sat at home in a dark room, ravaged by addiction. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. I know, he's ravaged by it. He's not having fun with it. There's yeah. no fun at all. And he's saying, he's, well, he's trying to have fun with Bruce Willis, who he has a definite man crush yeah. on. He, he actually looks at Bruce Willis and goes, this is how to live. Because he goes out, he parties, he shows the barman how to mix cocktails. <laughs> he's, he's the life and soul of the party. But he says the difference is Bruce Willis is a partier and I'm an addict. The next day they're filming and Bruce Willis is bright as a button and he's hanging. He's like, how do I do it like Bruce does? Because he can't start, because probably when they part at the end of the night, he's going home and drinking another bottle of vodka yeah. before he goes to sleep. Yeah. So when he wakes up, he said every single day during filming, he was totally hungover, painfully hungover, but he still goes out every night with Bruce. So he's like, right, I'm going to try partying with Bruce and then taking this pill to sleep. Yeah. He's not having proper fun ever. Gosh. I know. Also, you know what does make it worse is just having the money. To I know, to fund that. it and yeah. to fund the rehab. Yeah. yeah. So at some point, I can't remember what film it is where he has a jet ski accident. Do you remember? Oh, it's with Salma Hayek. They were in Vegas, oh, okay. I think. So when he's doing the film with Salma Hayek, there's jet skis involved. And then between takes, he says to one of the crew, can I have a go on that? And they kind of said, well, no, because insurance yeah. and stuff. And he says he, he's not done it very often, but he says... Being massively famous, it does have a cachet of pulling rank. And he kind of said, well, I'm going to do it. And so they let him do it. And he has an accident. He comes off the jet ski and he really hurts himself. So he's given painkillers, Vicodin. Is he clean at this moment in time? I don't think he ever is, Yeah, really. no, it's, that's a truth. But it, it was this particular pill. It was one pill as well. Yeah. One pill. I mean, painkillers are a real problem. Yeah. And he was absolutely ecstatic with this pill. He was like, ah, the clouds parted. Everything's wonderful. This pill's amazing. I've never felt better. I must get more of these pills. So bear in mind what that one pill did. In a very short space of time, he was on 55 of them. 55 a day. 55. Yeah, I mean, how? And it's so weird, a number as well, because it went to two, then to three, then to four ultimately up to 55. Wow. If he had 54, it didn't quite work. It had to be 55. That's crazy. Bloody hell. But I mean, if you're 55 a day before you get any kind of yeah. release from that, that's seriously addictive. He says at some point he's on methadone, Xanax, cocaine and vodka. Yeah. And a lot of all of them. Bloody hell. I mean, he does say like at one point he has a grand mal seizure and it is no surprise. Yeah. Because he should be dead. Yeah, I know. I mean, what explodes at the beginning of this book? What had exploded? His colon. That's the one. Oh, my God. If that's not a wake-up His colon call. exploded. He says, opiates make you constipated. So I was so full of shit, <laughs> I nearly killed myself. That's his words. It's so full of shit, he exploded. And then he says, he had colostomy bag for months, and then they exploded all the time, and he does a rant about why... Can you send a rocket to the moon, but you can't make a colostomy bag that doesn't explode? <laughs> oh. It's covered in shit all the time. But I, I think he actually needs to say how terrible, and messy the reality yeah. of this actually is, probably to help other people mm -hmm. to put them off. Because after, I think he said something like 55 colostomy bags exploding on you, it finally sinks in that they're saying to you, if you take pills one more time, you will have a colostomy bag for the rest of your life. Now, if that was a neat, tidy colostomy bag, yeah, right. you might think, well, that's not, not so, so bad. bad. But if it explodes on you all the time, that's a deterrent. So actually, I think it's probably quite good that happened to him. <laughs> he says in writing this book that he now is clean and doesn't want a colostomy bag. He'll get emphysema if he continues smoking. So he's put a lot of time and money into getting hypnotised all the time. But that comes and goes, the smoking, but it's going but he also says when he was writing this book in 2020, he was in rehab, so off his head, he proposed to his girlfriend because he didn't want to be alone. Oh. When he got out of rehab and went home, he's like, what's this woman doing living in my house? She went, well, you proposed to me, did I? So he's writing this book very close to 2020 when he doesn't even remember proposing to a woman. So he's not out of the woods at all. There's yeah. no way. Oh, do you know what? I just 
got he, obviously he's writing this book he's clean but just his journey as an addict the amount of times he's been into rehab there's a joke in it that he says something like oh when i was 21 i finally became sober and i've only relapsed 65 times since right. it's just like his whole life yeah. is a pattern it's his life and this book does not tell me that it's not going to happen again oh no way i think it's beyond his control i do too and he says that he lies to doctors and tells them he's in agony when he's just got a slight annoyance to get to loads get of drugs. Yeah. So actually his biggest suppliers are his doctors. Oh my goodness as well. And he said when it becomes really hard to get drugs, he'd go to open houses. He said when he got there, he'd look around the house and he'd go to the bathroom cabinet and start taking the, their drugs. Yeah, so he's going to really posh houses That's in right. LA yeah. sort of thing. Wow. Yeah. You know, because well, he has you know to get up to addict. 55 per day. And he said That's it's his life's work every single day to try and get all the pills yeah. he needs. He's got, oh, my God. He says one of the reasons he's not taking pills now is because the amount he can easily get, 10, 20, whatever, it doesn't touch the sides. No. Basically, he's staying clean because unless he gets 55 pills or whatever yeah. he's on at the moment, it's just pointless. Yeah. There's just no point in him doing it. And it's so hard to get the level of pills yeah. he needs. But anything can trigger it. He says at one point, when he's sober, therefore he's shagging loads of women, he's saying to each woman, I do not want to go out with you. I am not in that place. I am just here for the good times. If that's good for you, you can go out with me. If you want more than that, do not go out with me. And it always worked. Yeah. Worked like a charm. But then he, it often just accidentally evolved into something. And one woman, he'd see it was coming into a relationship. So he put a stop to it. And then she was crying and hysterical and he couldn't handle it. Yeah. He visited her in a hotel room to try and calm her down. She went to the bathroom and he saw three of these pills. So he's like, well... This is too hard for me to handle. I'll have some pills. And then it starts. As soon as he's broken it out, it starts and it's any excuse. Yeah, the reason that you've just mentioned is quite extreme when you say so you understand why he took a pill. Yeah. But actually, it could be anything. Could be anything. Because he wants a reason almost. Yeah, and he he's says an it, he admits this. This is all... Wow. So actually, this book is a man who was in Friends and made some films who's an addict. And the book is mostly about addiction and what triggers it and how you behave. And I think it's a really important book for anybody who wants to be famous because the one thing that he explicitly states, and we know this because we've read a lot of these books mm. now, he says that you think that fame and money is going to solve all your problems and take you out of it. Oh, and he yes. says, well, it, it just doesn't. Says that nobody who isn't famous and nobody that isn't rich won't believe it. Yeah. He says, but you get fame and you get money and everything is still the yeah, same. Yeah. Whatever problems you have, they are still there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Bloody hell, it's a harrowing life. It really is. It's an honest book. But yeah. I have to say, I didn't finish this book with a good feeling about him. And I hate to say that. I do too. In a couple of years, if I hear that he's died, it will be no surprise. Not at all. Oh, it's so sad. <laughs> because he's obviously so talented and so funny. I, It's that awful thing where... He's desperate not to be lonely. He's desperate to be accepted because of that fear of abandonment he had at such a young age. And the awful thing is he's become such a full-blown addict that actually it's difficult for anyone to be with him. Mm. And I'm reading between the lines. I think he probably was very difficult to work with at times. He admits there was that film called Serving Sarah, which he was in oh, with Liz yeah. Hurley and stuff. And he basically admits that he ruined the chances did, of that film. Just yeah, being, and she never worked again. Yeah. As an actor. Oh, my God, he killed Liz Hurley's career. Yeah. <laughs> We're laughing. <laughs> I don't think she was amazing anyway, was she? Well, she was doing all right. Well. She was in Austin Powers and stuff. She was great in that. Yeah. All right. I'll give you that. And by the way, his family and friends were always there for him. And yeah. they've been amazing. He's surrounded by love. He says it. I couldn't have had more love. I've got love coming out my ears. Mm -hmm. People move into the hospital and sleep next to me. People are there for me for three months, day in, day out. No one leaves me alone. And yeah. I'm still this much of a mess. Yeah. Could he be any more ungrateful? <laughs> <laughs> do you like him? I do. Like now, after reading this whole book, do you I like him? I find it impossible not to like this fellow. He doesn't like himself very much at all. But how how the hell could I say a bad thing against him? He's, he's ill. He has he's a, a very ill person. He has a chronic illness, which I think at times, as much as his family really tried to help him, and it does sound like the whole friends juggernaut, etc., tried to help him, 
it's almost such a hopeless case. I don't know what you do with someone who is this much of an addict, it, it, who's been to is, rehab this it, many times. This, his life, as it is, is yeah. not a choice. He desperately doesn't want any of I it. It's out of his, oh, my God, if there's anybody who just thought, oh, let's listen to this about Matthew Perry, who somehow wasn't on social media or something and just thought he was the funny bloke from Friends, this will be a massive shock. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thrift Shop Biography. We love making this podcast and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are already listening. Um, We're new to this and you could really help us out by leaving us a review somewhere, wherever you listen to this podcast. And if you could share us, tell your friends about us or drop some links on social media. We have a Facebook page called Thrift Shop Biography. So make sure you come over there to hear about the episodes first and what else we're up to. Okay, see you next week. And if you're new here, there are loads more episodes now to go and listen in the back catalogue. So make sure you go and enjoy them. Okay, thank you very much.